You're fully lit. Yes. Okay. <laughs> I uh, I have a great face for audio, so um, I, I don't do a lot. I don't do a lot of interviews, but uh, here we are. Well, Jim, we are thrilled to have you because our book club listens to a lot of audiobooks, and so we've been anxious to have a narrator join us so we can find out more about you, oh, about sure. your process, and to kind of get things kicked off. I know that you are a longtime stage and screen actor also, so can mm -hmm. you tell us about yourself and how did you actually get into narrating audiobooks? Well, I was a character actor in New York City for many years. Um, and around the country in regional theaters. So I would, but I was based out of New York City. And as a character actor, we do a lot of, um, you know, a character actor is not basically not the leading man. So I was, you know, I play the, you know, the, the lawyers and the brothers and the shoe shop owner and all the, all the crazy characters that you, that you have in stories. And so I did a lot of that for in, in New York and elsewhere for, for many years. And then happened across um, a company about 20 years ago called Recorded Books. And they're one of the big publishers of audiobooks. And the publisher of that uh, organization, Claudia Howard, brought me into audition for a book. It was a serial. It was a crime thriller. Um, and... Oop, I think my my wife was in the in the picture over there, but, but we'll try to we'll try to keep her out. Um, and uh, so it was a it was a, a great book, but it had uh, a Russian mobster and a, a Jamaican thug, and so I had to do all of these <laughs> sneaking off in the background. I had to do all of these you know character voices, and I'm as a character actor, you know, I was trained in the theater and I was trained with dialect and and voices and all of that stuff. So. Um, I got the job and I've been barreling along ever since. And I, it was not long after that, I started doing um, uh, J.R. Ward's books, um, the Black Dagger Brotherhood books. I think we've done 34 or this may be the 34th coming up. So I've done a ton of them, you know, starting with, oh gosh, I can't even remember what the first one was. So I, I know all the characters and I know the storylines and, and that's really how I got started with audiobooks. I do a lot of uh, I do. I used to do a lot more nonfiction. Mm -hmm. Fiction is my preference because they're stories and they're characters, and um, I love that. I love telling stories. I'm in the middle of a book for Penguin Random House right now about Ted Kennedy, and it's a 600-page nonfiction book. And I shouldn't say I'm in the middle of it. I, I, I think I just finished it today. I'll probably get another 40 pages to go, but that's just a real uh, difficult. Nonfiction is really dry and academic, can be academic. Um, so I much prefer the fiction. And I love doing J.R. Ward's books. She is a terrific writer and writes, as you may know, or your, your oh, yes. colleagues may know, she writes with a very heightened sense of reality and of passion. And um, she's just a great storyteller. So I love all that stuff. And that's kind of the genesis of how it happened. Do you think a big part of that is your acting background of why you like the stories and the different voices and bringing those characters to life as opposed to the nonfiction, which I'm guessing would be a lot, like you said, a lot drier and more monotone probably? I love telling stories. I really do. I love, I don't, you know, you probably don't know, but I'm a, I'm the artistic director of a group. I'm in Western Massachusetts in, the, in what they call the Berkshires. Mm -hmm. And uh, there are three or four professional theaters in this area, mostly summer theaters. And I'm the artistic director of one of them called Great Barrington Public Theater. And so we're a development lab for new plays. So new plays, new writing, playwrights, writers, stories are my thing. And I love looking at structure and I love uh, working with writers to develop stories. And I've been doing that for 20 or 30 years. Well, with that, does that ever, I, I think I would have a, a big challenge with that when I'm then narrating a book, because do you ever find yourself kind of starting to analyze how the authors are also putting together the stories of, oh, well, maybe I can put this spin on it, or, or is it pretty much straight how it is? Well, I, I think if I'm, if I'm hearing your question right, it, it's every 
writer has a different world and a different um, style. Um, not all writers that I narrate are um, have the same kind of style that J.R. Ward does. A lot of fantasy or uh, romance writers write with a completely different world. And uh, I like I, I like to do all different types of of stories. You know, I think one of your colleagues had mentioned the Chet and Bernie mysteries. Mm -hmm. You know, I love doing those books. It's a it's a it's a it's a series about a private detective in the Southwest who goes on these great adventures. In there's you know some there's they're kind of gritty stories, but the stories are told by his dog Chet, mm -hmm. and I'm Chet. And everybody else in the story is a variation or a, just a, um, a shade off of the main character. So I love all kinds of fiction. What do you do to prepare for the books that you're reading? Do you read pre-read them or is it a fresh take as soon as you go into the studio? I generally try to read the books ahead of time. Um, and if not reading them, for instance, if it's a series that I do and I know very well, I'll skim through it to find out who the characters are and what the general storyline is so that I've got an idea of what's happening. You don't want to get to the you don't want to get to the last chapter of the book and someone says, "Wow, that British accent that that uh character had was really wonderful." And you know, you don't want to find that out at the end of the book. Mm -hmm. You want to know all of that stuff ahead of time. How do you especially in doing the Black Dagger uh Brotherhood series how do you remember all the different voices and nuances to the characters? Or is it something that as soon as you get back into that particular series, you know, and you can set it out, no problem who it is? I think that um, the you find out who the protagonist is for the that particular story, and they have your kind of hero voice. Mm -hmm. And it's the same with every book in the series. Whoever the protagonist uh, is in that particular story, they're your main kind of um, voice. And I guess because I've done those particular stories, I've done them for so long. I know like for instance, Wrath, the king, the blind king, he's got a little bit more of gravitas than maybe the other characters. So I try to imbue him with a little bit more um, you know, resonance. And everybody else really um, has their own voice, but I, I think in general, the way she um, writes is that she sets it up that way. Here's the story of um, Butch and, you know, his Shellen or, um, you know, Vicious. And, and, and so that every book has their protagonist. And I, I give that protagonist their own uh, identity, vocal identity. Mm -hmm. If that makes any sense. I'm, yes, I'm, no, it I'm, does. Yeah. <laughs> uh, well, and especially because of the world that she has created, and there's so many different characters. Mm -hmm, yeah. that, that's always been one where it's like, okay, how can the narrators even keep that straight when I know sometimes as a reader, I'm having to flip through, of, okay, wait a second, who was that person? Much less keep other notes on it that I would then have to portray out just boggles my mind at times. Well, the, um, for instance, the um, Fritz, who is the, the, the head dog and uh, the head servant is a stock kind of character. Mm -hmm. And uh, he was easy to find, you know, he um, it, it's a little, almost a little bit of a British butler. And, um, and so that voice was easy for me to, to find also that there are some other tangential or peripheral characters like Lassiter who have their own voice, who is kind of androgynous. Mm -hmm. and, um, and, and so those voices are the same. And I recall those throughout the series. Um, but, um, but, and there are other characters too that have their own identity that it's, it's fairly, when, you, when you've narrated 25 or 30 um, books in a series, comes fairly naturally the the different characters it's why I love doing that mm -hmm. you know do you receive ever receive notes from the authors um especially when oh, a yeah. new character is introduced and and like with Ward's books and where it's a whole new world 
there's a lot of terms that are not um, not one that everyone is automatically going to know exactly how to pronounce. So do you get that feedback initially or do you make a first go at it and then corrections later? How does that part of the process work? So I have a pretty open line with um, uh, Ms. Ward mm -hmm. um, who lives in the South. And uh, so we have a fairly open relation, you know, relationship and that I can email her or text her and say, look, I've, I've got a pronunciation that I want to run by you. Um, there are some pronunciations that she's changed over the years yeah. um, and that we had to kind of shift in midstream. But uh, yeah, we've done it. In fact, well, recently we did a, a Zoom uh, session together um, with her, with I, what I, I thought was a lot of fun. She's a she's a hoot. She's she's a pistol. And uh, we had we had a lot of fun. My my gripe to her was that. Uh, they never put my face on the, or, or, you know, me on the cover of the books. It's, it's always like some Fabio type guy. So I thought maybe if I put like a blonde wig on, um, I could audition for, you know, a book cover, but it's just not to be. Now, granted, we, we usually put the book covers up during the interviews that we do, but for our advertising for book club tonight, we do have your headshot up. So oh. I mean, come on. Yeah, it's probably a little old, my headshot. I haven't taken one in a while. So, <laughs> you know, it's just actors always have headshots that are 10, 15 years old. So um, mine is, uh, I'm sure mine is, is a, you know, a way back. But we have it out there. So, I mean. Oh, okay. Right kind of there. Okay. <laughs> when you're recording, are you recording at a studio or do you have something set up at home or do you do a combination of both? For many years, I recorded in New York City mm -hmm. and in various studios all over the city. Uh, now, you know, the business kind of changed about 10 years ago um, where studios um, and certainly with the, with the pandemic, it, it changed. But, but years before that, narrators started recording in their own studios or at other studios near where they lived. And um, when I moved up, I still have a place in New York City, but I spend most of my time up in Western Massachusetts in the Berkshires. It's kind of where um, the three states meet, where Connecticut and New York and, and Massachusetts all meet, that little triangle in Southwestern Massachusetts. And um, I have a studio on my property here. So I have an engineer who comes to me and we work together all day long and we record. I don't push any buttons. Uh, that's not my thing. Um, I just have, I just get into my isolation booth and I have an iPad in front of me and I just tell the story. And fortunately, that's, that's all I have to do because if I had to engineer and, you know, it's a, it's pretty complicated, this stuff, you know, in terms of um, editing and, you know, uploading files and mastering and proofing and all of that stuff. And so I don't fortunately have to do any of that stuff, which I'm, thrilled about. So you're using an iPad then for all of your readings? Mm -hmm. And is it? I have the iPad on a stand in front of me mm -hmm. and it's backlit. So there's very little light in my booth. And I'm, I'm just, I'm just reading off the iPad and I'm finger rolling as I'm, as I'm reading. Usually I take a PDF and I blow it up to the outside margins of the of the ipad and um i can do that for you know today from 10 to 4 30 and that's why i'm i'm probably a little bleary eyed right now because that was a those are long days when you do the usually it's not that long but today was a long day um but but that's generally how i do it sometimes i have a little bit of a light in the studio um if I need to see a little bit more of what I'm doing, but I like to just have the backlit iPad and that's all I've got in there. And I'm guessing the scrolling, does that allow you not to have to take page break? Right. Rests and when I first started in the audiobook business, you know, 20 years ago, it was all on paper mm -hmm. and you would have to pages, you know, you would have to take a, you know, try not to make noise when you're, right. you know, folding pages and so forth. Now it's all digital and I haven't used pages in 15 years. It's all digital. We, they send us the PDF and uh, we, just, we just work off of that. 
And how often are you having to take breaks during while you're recording, or is it just as long of a stretch as you can make it? Yeah, no, I can I can go pretty well. I I have a thermos full of herbal tea mm -hmm. that I you know a big thermos when I start, and hot fluids really helps me to lubricate my voice and my pipes. And I also have Ricolas, the uh, sugar-free Ricolas that also help me to lubricate. So I've got a cup of tea and the Ricolas, and I've always got those com the combination of those moving, you know, in some fashion. But I, you have to take breaks or else, um, you know, your voice can just get um, raspy and um, you can overuse it. They're just like an opera singer, you know, when you get to a certain age, your voice just doesn't do the same things that it could when you were 25 or or 30 or you know 40 even and i'm a little i'm a little bit older than that so you you have to you have to pace yourself and you have to hydrate systemically mm -hmm. so that you're drinking enough fluid so that you're lubricated and your um your brain is lubricated because it's a lot of focus you really are you know i wear glasses so you know you're you're looking at these at these fonts on an iPad yeah. and um, you know, it, it takes a lot of focus. And then when you're in the zone as a narrator, I like to say that when you're in the zone, you're, you're kind of at one with the story and you're not thinking about any of the, you know, the peripheral um, what's happening outside the studio. You are just in the story and you are, you know, an hour may go past, may go by and it's almost like five minutes. You're just in, you're at oh, yes. one with the story. And it, the same thing can happen, I think, with actors in a part, in a role. But when you're telling a good story, it can really take you away. I mean, as readers, we can definitely relate to oh, that. Oh, sure. I mean, no question. Do you find, I mean, speaking about being in that zone, do you find that it's a different experience then when you are reading and a book as the narrator and the actor of the book versus when you are reading a book for your own pure enjoyment? You know, Sarah, I haven't read a book for my enjoyment in years. Mm. I just can't because I read a lot of scripts for the theater. I'm, you know, I'm directing a play here or there, but I'm, but the audiobook world, it requires you to do so much reading that I just can't read for pleasure anymore. Mm -hmm. And it's just too, I read a lot of periodicals and magazine articles and like I said, scripts, but uh, I wish I could read a little bit more, but no, it's just, it's too, it's too much. It's too much. Does that me. also transfer over to watching TV and movies? Um, I can watch a little, I can watch a little TV. I've got a couple of shows that I, I watch. I, I watch a lot of British uh, television and, uh, you know, through BritBox, my wife and I watch, I'm watching one right now called Scott and Bailey. It's it's really kind of great. They're, you know, the two women who are the protagonists in the story and they're terrific. Your, your colleagues may, and your viewers may, may know oh, yeah. that story, but we watch a lot of uh, TV, my wife and I. And uh, so I can do that because that's relaxing for me. I don't mm -hmm. have to, you know, read. Um, and I don't listen to much audio. Once in a blue moon, I will, I'll listen to an audio book. I'll, I'll listen to a narrative, but I'm, 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 I'm such a prig when it comes to that stuff. And I'm, <laughs> and I'm so critical that I, I can't listen to other narrators because I'm constantly criticizing what's going on. So I, I have to stay away. Although there are some narrators who I, I think are terrific. Mm -hmm. yeah. Do you, have you ever done audiobooks where you are part of a full cast recording or has everything always been solo? Yeah, I've done a few and it's becoming easier now with technology. You can, Everybody records from their own different studios. You don't have to be all in the same spot. Uh, and I've done a bunch of them. I, I've done, um, um, I think the last one I did was a Jody Picoult book um, about, there were four characters in it. And uh, I think we got, a, we got a nomination for that for an Audi, but it, it, I forget the name of the book. It was about a heart. Um, oh gosh, and four different characters, but that was probably eight, 10 years ago. Mm -hmm. But they're fun. They're fun to do. It's just the technology is tricky. Mm -hmm. Oh, wow. Yeah. So sounds like today has been a long day 
with yeah. the amount of time that you were in the booth. I mean, is that typical or what is Ordinarily, your typical recording day? Yeah, or to, for working for this particular publisher, um, whether you're in person in one of their studios, which I did for many years in New York, or whether I'm working here, they have a director who Skypes in or Zooms in with me and the, and the engineer, who is just another person listening to the story. And so if I miss something or there's a, you know, a word burger or something, they will tune in and say, you know, Jim, let's go back and pick that up. And we'll just go back and do that. And also for tone. Um, but generally, it's just me and my engineer. And we work on our own schedule. Mm -hmm. And uh, I work from, say, 10 to 3 o'clock. That's a, that's a normal day. Mm -hmm. today. And in typically this, a Monday through Friday. Yeah, I don't work on the weekends with narrations. I uh, it's it's basic, basically weekdays, and most most days of the week there'll be there may be a day or two during the week when I'm not working when I've got other stuff. I had to take um, most of most of July and uh, the first couple of weeks of August off from narrations because I was directing and working on a couple of theatrical productions here in the Berkshires. Mm -hmm. But in general, throughout the course of the year, um, that's my schedule. And how do you get the different books? I mean, are you still having to audition for certain books? Do authors request you? What is that process now? Uh, great question. The, the Sometimes um, an author will email me through um, a website that I have for the theater, or they'll have my email through, through ACX, which is... Um, a, a website, acx.com, where narrators and uh, authors and publishers can meet and audition for books. I rarely audition for audiobooks anymore. Um, I used to do a lot of it early in my career, but I, but I, um, I don't, I guess I don't have to so much anymore. Authors know who I am, or certainly the publishers will pitch me a book. Um, I've done a couple of books for Danielle Steele. I think I've done five or six books. Uh, do you know who she is? Oh, yes. Yeah. So I, I think I've done five or six or maybe, maybe more books. Um, I do audition for her. I don't know why. They keep asking me to audition for, and I'm like, well, I've only done five or six books for her, but her agent, I think, um, likes to hear three or four voices for each book. And I'm happy to mm -hmm. pitch in. There's a page or a page and a half on that particular book that I can just pitch into the publisher and and they can send it along. So so those are really the only auditions I do for audio. Is there a dream writer that you'd like to collaborate with? I love fiction and uh any good storyteller, any good writer. I just um I did a really great book recently uh called The Voyage. It was a book by Philip Caputo, a really kind of I guess you would call it New York literary fiction. Um, a beautiful book. And I love doing that stuff. Of course, I love fantasy and I love the, I think the, I think J.R. Ward's books are kind of my favorites because they're, they're so good. She's such a good writer and such a good storyteller. And, you know, they're, they're erotic. And I, you know, and I love doing that stuff. You know, you can't just phone that in, you have to go for it. And, um, and so I love doing all that stuff. She, she just really fleshes out characters and she creates characters who are very stoic and loyal and especially the men and and women who are loyal to each other this kind of band of of comrades and uh, she has great themes and even though they're you know vampires there are great themes of loyalty and love and compassion and passion and uh and she's just a good writer you could, you could write in any genre but i really like her books but any real good fiction, I love, I just love to do. I'll do anything that um, is really good. Well, Jim, I want to transition a little bit into what we call our fresh fiction facts. These are a couple quick type Q&As. Um, Roll with it. What Lay it on me. comes to you, right? Uh, who would you most want to be stuck in an elevator with? Oh, my God. Stuck in an elevator. I've been stuck in an elevator with a, a surprising amount of people. Um, who would I want to be stuck in an elevator with? Oh my gosh. I think maybe, um, oh gosh. Uh, I think Scarlett Johansson. She's, she's fascinating to me. 
in, in addition to the fact that she's just gorgeous. Mm -hmm. And uh, I just, I really, I like her a lot as an actor, as a person, mm -hmm. you know, as a humanist. Uh, so that's my pick. Okay. Uh, what luxury item or unnecessary product or service can you absolutely not live without? <laughs> oh, wow. Um, well, I don't know. Luxury. I love a really high quality, really good bed. Oh. And I'll pay a lot of money for a really good bed. Um, I have a king size bed that's, uh, I won't even tell you how much it costs, but it's a really good one. And that, I guess you would call it a luxury item. Um, I have an e-bike that I love too. That's just really fun. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, they're great for, you know, old guys with big butts like me. <laughs> if you suddenly found yourself stranded, what three things would you probably have on you? Oh, I would probably have some really good bourbon. Um, I would have, what else would I have? Oh gosh, that's a that's a tough one. Uh, I might have a I might have my iPhone on me, okay. uh, just to communicate. Um, and then what else? I would have, I would have a really wonderful woman like my wife with me as well. Good yeah, answer. Have, yeah, you know, I'm I had to add the addendum like like my wife on there as well. <laughs> yeah, even though she's not listening, I had to throw that in. Yeah. Now, I'm really curious. Oh, she about said this she one. heard that. Oh, Sorry, she heard that I mean, one, huh? <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> what is the most terrible movie that you legitimately enjoy? A Everybody legitimate. else pans it, but it, but you just love watching it. Over uh, and over. It could be uh, Talladega Nights. Oh wow! Okay. With Ricky, with Ricky Bobby. That, of course, Ricky Bobby. Know, it's yeah. A, it's a ridiculous movie, but it it makes me laugh. <laughs> <laughs> that and you know my cousin Vinny. I think those are you know. Watch that the played. other day again. Classic. Oh, it's, it's on yeah. every day. It's on like every other day. But that movie is really funny. I had dinner once with, um, um oh God, um, um, Steve Pesci. No, no. Uh, or who played the? Who plays the lead? Uh, who won an? Uh, who won an Oscar for that movie? Oh, Marissa Tomei. Marissa Tomei. Oh my God. Am I, I am brain dead. I was out with um, Patty Lapone and she brought Marissa Tomei and we had dinner at, we had dinner at, a, at Joe Allen's in New York City one time. This many years ago, we were on, we were on Broadway. Patty and I were on Broadway in a play together. That is oh a long gosh. time ago. And my, my, I, I hope Marissa Tomei doesn't, isn't watching because she's going to be like, you fucking jerk. <laughs> Well, I'll have to save all the questions about Patty Lapone at a later date. Oh, I'm, yeah. I've no, been she's... refraining from some of the people that you've been starting with. She's, a, me, so. she's a diva with a capital D. I've done a bunch of movies with a bunch of stars, and uh, they're all great, but, you know, <laughs> get up. I can't, drop, I dinner, can't drop any names. Yeah. <laughs> I, you know, I've done movies with you know, Philip Seymour Hoffman. We did yep. a man. I've done a bunch of David Mamet films, mm -hmm. State of Maine, and and heist with Gene Hackman and Alec Baldwin and some great, you know, Sarah oh, Jessica yeah. Parker and Bill Macy. William H. Macy is an old friend of mine. I was at his wedding in, in Colorado many, many years ago. Whoa. He and his wife, Felicity, are old friends of mine as well. Awesome. Yeah. No, they're great. They're great people. Oh, I'm I'm hop, I'm dropping names. <laughs> okay, we'll go back to the fresh fiction facts. Okay. Yeah. Um, what do you own an absolute ridiculous amount of? Oh gosh. Uh, a ridiculous amount of hmm that's a that's a good one um sound foam mm. sound foam is what you when you build your studio it's what you buffer yes. the yeah. outside of i don't have a ton of sound foam oh yeah. do you like keep it in additional storage for when you uh, need I, it I and bought way too off? much when i was building my studio and i've got a ton of it if anybody needs any sound foam <laughs> Just text me. I'll, I'll send it to you. <laughs> no, so you need to contact like some engineering labs mm. that might be nearby because they would use no, that. I, I actually, I actually think I can pawn it off on a, a friend of mine who wants to build a studio. So I think I can, I can sell it to him cheap. <laughs> Where do you consider to be your ideal paradise? 
you know, I was just there. And uh, I don't know if you or your listeners or know where Provincetown is on Cape Cod. Oh. It's the it's the tip of Cape Cod and it's out there. It's it's Cape Cod is shaped like a like an arm and Provincetown is here at the tip. Cape Cod goes out into the ocean off the Atlantic and come. that place to me is like paradise. Oh, wow. I just spent a week out there recently. In fact, I, I think I might have a little bit of a tan left over from it. Um, even though I, I, re I rarely tan because the Irish in me is kind of prevalent these days. Um, I look like more like Mickey O'Flaherty than, than I would Italian. But that part of the world, Truro and Provincetown, are just heaven to me. Mm. Wow. Yeah. What is the it. most unnecessary thing that you've ever bought online? Oh, God. Let's see. The most unnecessary thing. You know, there have been a lot. <laughs> of things I've bought off the unnecessary things I've bought online. Um, yeah, I don't know. Maybe, uh, oh, I think I bought a, uh oh, there's my cat Mookie in the background there. A little tuxedo cat. Mookie, come on. Come say hello, Mookie. We always love it when the pets make an appearance. <laughs> oh, yeah, there he is. And his brother Jackpot is around here somewhere. So um, I think I bought a, one of those little butt packs, you know, you wear with the, and I don't think I've ever used it. It was just didn't, it just didn't fit. <laughs> didn't really, didn't really work out. But back, but it looked good on, it looked good on the computer. So I think I got it. Well, Jim, let me ask you one question that has had a lot of debate in our book clubs before. Mm -hmm. um, because a lot of us are listening to audiobooks. Yeah. In various uh, forums, so some of us at home, so at work, in the car. What are your feelings on when people speed up the listening rate? Or my is that does. absolutely, oh my gosh, just a horror. Oh, she would speak up my, she would speak me up if, if, if she could. <laughs> but I, um, I think it's fine, you know, especially for narrators who really talk slow. You know, I'm going to tell you a story. <laughs> I rip through stories. And if you were to jack me up a quarter or, you know, whatever, and I sound like that, uh, then that would be fine. The technology's better. Technology's yeah. better. Oh, you can really do it. I, I don't know about <laughs> any of that stuff other than that she she does it and she likes it. Mm -hmm. um, but I uh, I have no, you know, no gripes with not that. Not personally stuff. offended by that. Then. No, I'm certainly not personally offended. You know, <laughs> I go in for some low tones and, uh, you know, I get like Wrath has, you know, like the, 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 the low tone and the hero voice. Um, so I don't know what it does to that. I think you would kind of you know, get, get me up to here. But uh, uh, I would imagine that that uh, your listeners, you know. Well, that's where the technology has gotten better because it used yeah. to be because I've listened to audio books for, you know, where I was used to call them books on tape on things. Yeah, that's and right. So when there were it would be forwarded, right? It's like. Oh no, I'm listening to a series of the chipmunks or something. <laughs> now I I'm much more comfortable, even if it's sped up. But we have others that are just like, oh no, that just ruins the whole perception of it. And like I said, it's can a big debate up, topic. Can you speed up the voice without getting the kind of Alvin and the chipmunks effect? Yes. Oh, well then that I think that's fine. But I happen to know a couple of narrators who are really slow so, yeah they tell slow stories so and you know all the power to them but uh not my cup of tea i learned in the theater years ago take the wrinkles out of it and you know rip through the pauses don't pause just you know just go mm -hmm. and you know just you know, david mamet used to tell us that just you know just take the air out of it and go okay. that the audience doesn't want to listen to you act in the pauses. Um, so I try to rip through most of the stories. I think you have to though, and I think your readers will agree, you have to pause a little bit for effect sometimes. And I find that that I you have to do that. You know, if you're telling a story that requires it. But I um, but I'm certainly not offended when you when you rip through that stuff. 
No, not at all. Jim, before we hop over to our happy hour and follow up Q&A with some of our other participants, how can our readers follow you and stay in touch and know what all you're working on? Well, um, you could certainly, um, I have a fan page. I mean, I have a Facebook page with, you know, friends and I don't post much on Facebook, even on the fan page. So you don't see me, I don't have a presence on social media, although for the theater company, I, I kind of do a little bit. Um, but you'll see me on Facebook, um, my own personal page, I, the fan page once in a blue moon, I'll, I'll post about a book that I'm doing, but rarely. So, um, I think the best way to do it would be to just maybe follow, um, follow the theater, Great Barrington Public Theater, uh, dot org, and the theater is T-E-R. So you could look at that and follow the work that we're doing, and uh, and uh, that would be one way to kind of keep and keep tabs on what I'm doing. Um, but your listeners are are welcome to reach out to me via email or or otherwise if they have questions about books. I get contacted on Facebook by, um, you know, messaged um, on Facebook by a lot of people who listen to audiobooks. A lot from the um uh the black dagger brotherhood who have questions about it or comments about it and i'm happy to respond well fantastic well thanks again for joining us tonight jim i really enjoyed this me too